let's go to Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah. And let's go to chapter 58. Now, it's interesting how the Lord dropped this on me. Because I haven't been doing a whole lot of fasting lately. Doing a lot of travel. So I, I do it sporadically. I'll skip a meal here, skip a meal there. That kind of thing. Uh, generally don't eat or don't eat a whole lot before I, I come in and speak in the morning. I don't want my belly getting in the way of the Holy Ghost. There's sometimes conflict with that. And uh, so uh, Isaiah 58 is a very interesting chapter about uh, fasting. And what God is bringing out in this chapter is about the heart of fasting. And not just merely the fact that you're avoiding food but the fact that your heart is moving in a direction uh, of His purpose. And it's always with uh, divine purpose. You have to understand everything the Lord is asking of you is not only for your good, but for His purpose. And His purpose is always bigger than yours. His ideas are always bigger than yours. Uh, His desire is always bigger than yours for you, and for, for what He wants to do through you to reach others. And, and that's why there's glory in the story, because everything you go through, um, uh, as Melissa shared with it has a redemptive purpose. And your story should always be, even, listen, and you'll notice this, even, you know, you'll, you'll get up and you'll get sometimes, uh, you know, we have the drug addicts, we have the former prostitutes or whatever, and, and when they're telling it right and when they're really in the things of the Spirit, it always has a redemptive touch to it. They're no longer the addict. They're no longer the prostitute. They're no longer this. They're no longer that. Because Jesus has come, and through His name and by His blood and through the instrumentality of His Word by the Spirit, He's changed them. There's been a transformation. And so He comes to set us free. He comes to deliver us. So there's always this redemption in, in the story. There's always an end to it. And so I was reading through Isaiah, and this morning, again, Belinda, we were singing a song about, about the coal being taken and touching our lips and being made clean. Well, of course, that's all Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah, I love Isaiah, first of all, the prophecy of Isaiah. But uh, Isaiah 6 is where he sees the Lord high and lifted up. You remember the train of our Lord's robe flows throughout the temple. And, and there are the seraphim crying out, holy, holy, holy. I mean, folks, you and I, <clears throat> unless you've been caught up into heaven and gone into the, the holy place like that, you, you, you and me have never seen anything like that. I'm going to. Hope you have that same expectation. But... But th this is very real. So he sees the Lord and uh, immediately in, in um, the presence of infinite, infinite, infinite glory and infinite holiness, he sees himself as unclean. And he just says, woe is me. And not like, you know, self-pity, woe is me. No, like, woe is me. Because he beholds the glory of the Lord God in his holiness. And, you know, when you and I see him, you know, eventually, however he may appear to you in the beginning, all of us are going to appear before his throne and see him in his glory. And uh, the beautiful thing about it is it won't be woe is me because we've been redeemed by his own blood. And he, the king who's on his throne, will stand up for you and me. There's always redemption. Glory. So the Lord is always moving on us. Well, I'm going to read these few verses, and then we're going to begin to make comment, because I want you to see some things here. And it's all about the heart. Now, those of you who practice spiritual disciplines and you know about, you know how, about prayer, you know about reading the Scriptures, and you know, you know that fasting is a part of a spiritual life. And you fast for different reasons. You, you fast for breakthrough. You fast to draw closer to the Lord. You fast to overcome the enemy. Uh, you, you know, a lot of different ways you fast and a lot of different way, reasons you fast. But, you know, you're living this spiritual life and with these spiritual disciplines. So this is with purposes and it's always redemptive. 
So here is the Lord, and the Lord has a little bit of a, an issue with Israel because of her sin, because of her idolatry. She's got her eyes on everything and everybody except Him. And yet, she loves to come to church, and she loves to crawl close to the Lord with her, with her mouth, but her heart is far from Him. You know, she goes through the motions, and not really serious. So the Lord has issue with her about this. So this is what He's saying to Israel. So I'm going to read it, and let me just say this so that none of you get down in the mouth. I'm not talking about you necessarily. All right, here we go. Here we go. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So he's talking to Israel. Yet they seek me daily. Now they're full of sin, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? So here's this hypocritical nation who's not walking with the Lord. Their heart is not in tune with the Lord, but they love showing up at synagogue, worshiping the Lord, delighting to hear the Word, you know, praising the Lord in song, da-da-da-da-da. And they fast, and then they're all upset because God's not answering their prayers. You know, you have to understand that when I fast, you have to understand I'm not just doing that for the health benefit. And there is health benefit. But I'm not doing that for the health benefit. It's so I can get answers. And when I pray, I don't pray just to exercise my vocal cords. I pray so I get answers. You know, everything we do has purpose, has advancement in our lives, whether it's for you or your children or your marriage or your family or your business or this nation or whatever it is, the church has purpose. You're going to see that here. He has purpose. In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. So they oppress people. You know, here, here they are, the people that work for them, you know, that are under them, they, they exploit them. And, and by finding pleasure, they mean they, they're just self-serving, self-serving pleasure. That's what the Lord's after here. Verse 4, indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with a fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a boorish and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? You know, when the Lord's asking questions, it's not because He's looking for an answer. He's talking to His people that they'll start raising questions. See? That's what he's after. Verse 6. Is this not the fast I have chosen? Now here we go. I want you to see, beloved, when you fast, when you pray, when you seek the Lord God, it's with purpose. The Lord's after something in your life for others. He is after for something in your life that is for others. It doesn't end with you. Here it goes. Is this the fast I, haven't cho I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. And when you see the naked, you cover him. And hide not yourself from your own flesh. An interesting statement. It just means... As human beings, we know the plight of other human beings. And it's very easy just to turn the head and ignore. Rather than pay attention. There's, Jesus has a story about that. It's called the uh, um, Good Samaritan. 
you know, there are the guys, that were re religious leaders, just kind of turn their head the other way because, you know, I don't, don't want to get involved with that. I mean, a shoebox ministry, okay, but, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Whoa, I've already digressed. I'm already messing with you. But I hope it's for good. So when you see the naked, you cover him. When, when you, and you don't hide yourself from your own flesh. Now look at this. Here, here we go. See, it's not just for them. It's for you. Then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as noonday. Then the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. Then He will strengthen your bones and you'll be like a watered garden, like a spring of water who waters fail not. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Look at this. Looking for those to come. Raising up the next generation. Our sons and our daughters. Our grandchildren. Our great-grandchildren. Raising them up. Bringing them forward. And you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor Him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I, the Lord says, will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, the beautiful thing about this is all redemptive. It's redemptive. And, and he's reaching out to multiple streams here. He's not just talking to an individual. He's talking to a nation. And God is able to take a nation and in one day turn it upside down. In one day, God can save a nation. We know that in one day a nation can be destroyed. We know that from history. But do you know that in one day a nation can be saved and can be delivered and turned upside down in righteousness? That can happen also. And there's a process that God brings us about. It's like Joseph going from the pit to the prison, you know, Potiphar's house, to, you know, the highest place in the land under Pharaoh. You know, there's a process to it. But God is working in your life to bring about a redemption that far exceeds you. It's for the generation to come. And the older you get, like myself, the more you realize that this is true and how much your life and your words matter. And here he's telling us that things will happen to you personally. Notice he, he says here that things will change for you in, in verse 10. He says, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then your light, your light shall dawn in the darkness. Your darkness shall be like noonday. The Lord will guide you continually, satisfy your soul in drought, strengthen your bones. You'll be like a water garden. You will, you will, you will. You will, you will, you will, you will, you will. Over and over and over and over again. He wants you to believe it and obey it. And then it happens. God is, is doing something in His church today far beyond the, the reaches of sight or mere sound. It's like the resurrection of our Lord. It's going on in the hidden places. To where you seek Him, and you walk with Him, and you obey Him, and you put Him first. Now here, with Israel under the law, He had an issue with them because they would take the Sabbath, and instead of worshiping Him on the Sabbath, they were out playing and doing their own thing. Or they were oppressing those who were under them. And God is telling us, this is not, this is not for my people Israel, and it's certainly not for His church. And so there is a, a move of the Spirit that's going on because God really is, as I said to begin this service this morning, He really is restoring a first century faith in this 21st century. And see, it's not just a matter of working signs and wonders. It's a matter that like Aquila and Priscilla, or like Lydia, 
or like the jailer with his family. It's all of these different things, not just the apostles, but all of them doing things that are beyond mere human touch. But it's the moving of the Spirit in their lives and their response to the Lord in their lives. And then the Lord brings the breakthrough. You notice He talks about that here. You know, up here in verse 6, here's the fast I want. You know, it's, not, it, it's to loose the bands of wickedness. Undo heavy burdens. Let the oppressed go free. And praise God, every yoke is broken. Every yoke is broken. And the Lord is doing this with purpose in our lives because this is what He wants to see in your life. And He wants to use you in this manner to bring glory. I, I think one of, the, one of the clearest ways this weight was made known to me was when I was in Titusville pastoring some 20 years ago. And uh, we had gone out uh, uh, in the morning there. There's, a, there's one McDonald's in Titusville. And we had gone to that McDonald's to get some coffee, you know, and get some other little goodies. And uh, uh, we pulled around the building, and I was going to, you know, park on that side. And, and I looked across the parking lot, pretty big, bigger than this room, on the far side of it. And there was a man, and he had one of those white canes. And he was doing this. And there was a, there was a fence, you know, a privacy fence. And there were the, the car, uh, you know, the cement bumpers, you know, where you can pull up to them. And he was bumping into those, those uh, bumpers uh, for the cars, you know, with his stick. And then once in a while he had, he had hit the fence and he had back away. And he was on the far side of the, of the parking lot. Well, I, I've just pulled around that side. I've got the family with me. And I turned to, to Cindy. I said, Cindy, I said, that man's blind. And he doesn't know where he's at. He's lost. He's blind and he's lost. I said, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go help him. I'm going to go help him. So, not to pull up on him with the car, I left the car there and I walked across the parking lot. And I called out to him so he knew I was coming. He probably knew I was coming for him. I called out, but I called out to him. I said, hey, here's what I said to him. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? You know what you want to say to blind people? What are you looking for? And he turned toward me. And I could tell, you know, he, his eyes weren't there. And uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm looking for the doorway there. The McDonald's is here. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, I said, it's right over here. And I just walked up to him, and I just just bumped him with, the, with my elbow. Now, you don't want to treat them like they're an invalid. Oh, I hope you're hearing this. The blind and the lost, you don't want to treat like they're an invalid. Because I get offended with it. Right. If I would have grabbed him and started pulling him, he would have jerked away. You don't do that to human beings. So I just went up and I just gently bumped him with my elbow. He just re 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 he just reached right up, took hold of my arm, you know. and I just gently walked him back across the parking lot, just chatting with him, talking to him. I got him to the door and opened the door for him. And there was, you know, it has those double doors. And I opened the first door for him said, I got it. He said, I got it. I got it now. I can see it. I can see it. And he reached right out with that stick, hit that next door, and then popped that door right open and went in. I went back to the car. Now, what the Lord did for me in that little experience is that he showed me how he deals with the lost and the blind. That they're trying to make their own way they, they, they have their various apparatuses. We know the blind will have the white sticks or the candy stripe, you know, how they tap along. And, and people will have, the lost and the blind have their own, their own means that they're trying to find their way. And they, they, they realize things aren't right. You know, obviously he realized things weren't right. He couldn't find the door to the McDonald's, but he was still trying. 
in the wrong direction. And what God deals with us, He wants us to be able to see them like He sees them because He sees them finding the door. His name is Jesus. He sees them finding the door and being brought in. And this is why it's so important that you and I get a hold of all that's being listed here in Isaiah 58 as it applies to us today, the church, not to ancient Israel, but to us today as the church, the spiritual truths, the principles in here. The fact, beloved, if, as you do these things, maybe, maybe this is the reason, um, maybe this is the reason that the health hasn't come like you thought it would, or the, the, the job hasn't opened up, or the finances have been held back, or or maybe the relationship hasn't been restored. Just because of something simple here, you're not following, and you do it, if you, if you do it, then boom, it all opens up. Because you're not in control of that. He is our Lord. And He's able to lead you to someone who is lost and blind to lead them to the door. All you are is a door opener. Jesus is His name. And you usher Him in. Now with that, in the New Testament, Jesus gives these stories of a shepherd and a woman who one loses a sheep, one loses a coin, and then there's the father who loses a son. And each time the story, the Lord's repeating it, using a different figure. The shepherd is the first one. And when you look at that passage, you come to understand, oh, wait a minute. Well, this, this is you, Lord Jesus. Why, well, you'll leave the 99, and you'll walk across the parking lot <laughs> to find the one. Well, well this is you. And, and then when you find him, you throw. I didn't throw him up over my shoulders, but... But you know, uh, you know, you, you, Lord, you throw the lambs up over your shoulders, you'll bring them back to the flock. You, you are the son. You, you, you rescue people. And then the Lord moves on and says, hmm, you know, the, this bunch, they're not getting it. You know, it be, get, well, what's the context for that? Who's got that story up? Hello? <laughs> Does anybody know? Yeah? Getting closer. In Luke 15, notice he says here in verse 1, Luke 15. Got that one for me, Lisa? Thank you. Thank you, hon. All right. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. Don't you love that about the Lord? I mean, all these folk from the IRS <laughs> and all the sinners, you know, are drawn to him. Now, you know, look, I, I, over the last 50 years, I've been in a lot of churches. And I can just tell you there are just a whole lot of folk aren't too happy if a sinner comes walking through the door Amen. of their little sweet little fellowship. Uh, they don't want it disturbed or upset by the fact that somebody a little out of sort may come in and different color, different skin, different eye shape, different color hair, different this, different that. Maybe they're tatted up. Maybe they're half strung out. And I don't want that in here. I'm here. Well, um, well that, that's why things don't happen in their lives. Because you see here with Jesus, I just don't you love this about our Lord? Weren't you just drawn to him? I was just drawn to him. I saw myself as I really was. I saw him as he really is. And I just, I was just drawn to him. And uh, he finds this sheep and he says, rejoice with me. And uh, all that happens. You notice in verse 2, the Pharisees and the scribes, they complained. Saying this man sinners and eats with them. So, you, so this is the religious bunch. You know, they're just folk sad. They're, they're so shriveled up in their heart. They're so hearted. Uh, they have no compassion, no 
uh, nowhere for anybody outside themselves. Um, and yet Jesus speaks these parables. He says, okay, here comes the shepherd. This is what I do. Then he moves on to the next one, the lost coin. The lost coin, this is a good one. And he says in verse 8, what woman having ten coins, silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And she finds it. And she calls her friends and neighbors, and they say, Rejoice with me, I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of God with the angels. Hallelujah. Well, you know, this is what the Holy Ghost does. Don't stumble over the fact he uses a woman to illustrate it. But the Holy Spirit, He just comes in, He brings light. You notice here, the first thing that happens, light! Light! Light comes. Light floods in. Light comes. And, and then the Holy Spirit begins to sweep. And changes. You catch it? And then you come to the Father. The Father is so beautiful. The Father is such a wonderful Father. I, I, I listed uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago, all the, all the sayings in the New Testament where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You ought, you ought to do a study like that sometime. You just write them out and then meditate on them. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Over and over again, Paul says that. And then Peter says it. Blessed be the God and Father. And the Father, remember, divides the inheritance with his sons, his two sons. The one son takes off. You know the story. But, but the point is, in coming back, and this is the thing that, this is why God has to deal with you and me uh, uh, Isaiah 58. Why well, has a deal with you and me the way he does? Because it's redemptive. And when the father sees that boy coming back a long way away, that father whew, heads right for him. He takes off right for him. And, and the son, he, he shows repentance, you know, all of that. But the father just hugs him and kisses him and welcomes him back home. And, and see, this is why the Lord is dealing with us to, t to tenderize us uh, better than a filet mignon is so that when they come back, we can receive them. When they come back, the Lord has worked such a, a degree of kindness in your heart, compassion in your heart, love in your heart, forgiveness in your heart, but you don't have this this thing, well, you know, uh, well, you shape up and I'll let you back in. You notice there wasn't any of that? When the father met him, and, and I, I think I've used this before, but you know, some people, they just want the, the, the prodigals that come home, they want them to grovel. Yeah, just get on down, I'll, I'll see, I'll think I'll let you back in maybe. Nah, there wasn't any of that nonsense. No, he, he said... Get the, get the best robe. Pull out the robe. Get get that ring for the for for the finger. Where's those sandals? Get those sandals back on his feet. And where's that fatty calf? Man, it is time to rejoice and be glad because that which is lost has been found. The blind and the lost are coming home. They're going to find the door. They're going to find the door. I've got children and they're going to find the door. You got prodigals? That was mentioned this morning. They're going to find the door. But the Lord has got to work with you because here's, here's what went on in that parking lot at, at uh, McDonald's. When I saw him, I stopped and I'm thinking, oh man, what, sh what, what should I do? And you know, there's a little, I got a little nervous. Now this may not be you, but you know, give me some slack here, some grace. This was 20 some years ago. Yeah, and I'm thinking, oh, I, I don't know if I can do that. I, um, I don't know if I want to be kind of embarrassing. I, uh, hmm, you know, nobody else around. I wonder if I should do that because I, I don't want to embarrass him. You know, I, I don't. So I said, I said, Lord, help me. Show me how to approach him. Show me what to do. And he did. Stop in the car. 
walking across the parking lot, calling out to him, Hey, hey, how you doing? What, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? And he tells me, and just coming up gently next to him and hitting him, just brushing him with the side with my elbow and leading him back. All of that the Lord showed me. I give my Lord all the credit and all the glory for it. But he's got to have people to do it. He's got to have people who are willing to do it. And, and the Lord is working these things because, listen, with everything the Lord's doing in your life, which is most, most precious, is with purpose. Not only for your good, but for the prodigals, for the lost coins, for the lost sheep. He's working this for you. And He's delivering you from any mindsets like the scribes and the Pharisees. He's delivering you from all that kind of mentality. And He's softening your heart where it's been hurt in the past, offended in the past, brushed off in the past. He's delivering you out of verse 2. He's bringing you into verse 1. And He's going to fulfill it in the following verses. So He takes you out of verse 2. He brings you into verse 1. And you become a magnet. You become a magnet. I mean, he just reached up like a magnet, <laughs> took a hold of my arm. I just walked and strolled him across the parking lot. So he makes you like a magnet where people are drawn to you. Now, this, this is something that Cindy and I had to, we had to learn because we danced around this with our kids. And I, 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 I don't um, apologize for mentioning my own kids because we're believing for them and we're trusting the Lord to bring them home to help them find the door. And early in, in our life, you know, uh, we would preach a lot to them. We would quote scriptures to them, strategically leave a little booklet, you know, uh, right there next to the uh, coffee table or whatever, you know. And uh, found out that was so unsuccessful. And, uh, and instead, just offended them. I actually had some of our kids, oh, Dad, Mom, don't, don't preach at us. Don't preach at us. We, we know that stuff. They do. They heard it all their lives. They were in church all their lives. They've heard that stuff. But they haven't seen Him. You can hear the stuff. But have you seen Him? Because this takes me back to Isaiah 6. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And it forever changed him. Forever changed him. He was cleansed by the Lord. And then, remember how the Lord is talking in the triunity of His being? Who shall, who shall uh, we send? Who will go for us? It's interesting in the Hebrew, it's in the plural. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God. Who will go for us? And Isaiah, remember how he said, uh, uh, I will. Send me. And what the Lord is doing, and he had to do with me that morning, it's, I know it's very simple, very, very childlike, but he had to get me to the place where he could send me across the parking lot. Rather than just let that man, blind and lost, Keep poking wrong. And this is what the Lord is doing with your own hearts. He's pulling you along. He's drawing you to Himself. It's with purpose for things in your own life and in the lives of others. Isaiah 58. It's with divine purpose. And what the Lord begins, our precious Lord begins in your life, He finishes. That's His beautiful promise. And you just, you just want to respond to Him in simple childlike faith. The, the, the faith of the first century, beloved, was what? Very childlike and simple. Just total trust. Total trust. They just trusted the Lord. So whatever He told them, they just started obeying. And see, this, this is the thing, and I'll close with this, but you have to understand that it's a very real and authentic and deep work that goes on in your life to, for you to, to really trust Him and then obey Him. So you just go ahead and step out. 
without everything being in place, everything making sense, you just step out and you trust it. And then you find that He is stepping up. Boom. I can't tell you how many times, how many times Cindy and I have just stepped out by faith, you know, without any um, assurance of anything. And then, boom, here comes the Lord right up into our presence. And He starts setting things in order, opening doors, closing doors, arranging circumstances, making divine appointments with people, setting up all the circumstances. You know, and it's because we took that one trusting step and the rest of it works. And so God is working in your heart to bring you a first century faith in this 21st century where you're going to just trust Him and, and obey Him and just simple childlike faith. And because of that, Kindness is going to flow out of you. The grace of God is going to flow out of you. Holding grudges and hatred toward people, uh, you'll become like your Savior. So I want to close with these verses. I jotted them down here. Here's Paul in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So you got the whole package right there. Paul's laid down his life. He's crucified with Christ. He's laid down his self-life. He's just following the Lord, obeying the Lord, simple trust. The faith that's in Him is what was in the Son of God. Just a simple trust. And he comes back and he says this in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, well, we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. And, you know, talk, thinking about that blind man, do you understand when I went up to him, I became his eyes. I became His eyes. And this is what the Lord is seeking to do with you. That you will become someone's eyes for the moment, for the experience, for the time, for the necessity. But you become their eyes. And they can see. And they can find the door. They can find the door. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Many, 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 many times. Cindy and I have done things. You have your own testimonies. Launching out in faith. Doing what you thought you heard the Lord say. And He confirms it. He shows it. Brings it to pass. The last one is not just Paul. But Peter and First Peter. Chapter 1. And this is all about Peter. And if anybody... Uh, if anybody experienced the redemptive love of our Savior, it was Peter and ended up being used in a way where we're still talking about him today. And just think, have you ever thought about this? These guys who were obedient and the, we read about these men and women that for all eternity, they are going to be rewarded and blessed because of all all the believers for the last 21 centuries have followed their words and example. Can you imagine the reward? <laughs> oh, my word. And you know they'll be so humble about it. It's like that one brother got caught up to heaven, digressing. Ran into the Apostle Paul. Now, I really perk up when I hear this. Ran into the Apostle Paul, huh? And he's telling the story. He ran into the Apostle Paul. And he says, uh, he says, Paul, what, what was the greatest thing that, that you ever experienced in God? And Paul said that the Lord thought my letters were Scripture. That the Lord thought my letters to the churches or scripture. It's like, how could that be? So, 
Peter, being Peter, has this beautiful relationship with the Lord. And it's so the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the second coming. That's New Testament phraseology for the second coming. That your faith may be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, take Your people this morning. Continue to draw them to Yourself, Lord. Continue to bring us into what is really pleasing in Your sight. The true fast, Lord. The fast of the heart. The purity of the heart. The holiness of the heart. Father, we just want to thank You that You're moving and working on us in such a way that redemption is arising in our own houses in our own families, among our own loved ones, our own children, our own relationships. And because of that, Lord, Your purpose is going to be affected. Your purpose is going to be sealed, not only to us, but to them by Your Spirit. And it shall never be lost. We thank You, Father, for using us in such a way that we may become a vessel through which your life flows. And your glory may arise in our life and you may be glorified in all things. And that, Father, we may become instruments in your hand whereby we may help others, help them to find the door. And we ask it, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God is so good, huh, man? Yeah. Well, two luminaries have returned from outer space here this morning. Dan and Mona are here with us this morning. Yay! <laughs> no, I missed you. Missed you. I have. They were down there with the alligators and the snakes and slogging through water, rescuing people out of the depths of the ocean. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Anyone need prayer here this morning? Yeah, Dan? Yeah, Brenda, just a second. Brenda? Yeah. So. Speak in my ear. You can. So, Belinda, why he's speaking, coming to speak in my ear, you go ahead and share. Yeah, we want to pray for him. So well, come on up, come on up. Uh, bring the silver-haired gentleman with you. The silver-haired old fox. Okay, come here, come here, come here. Come up here, come up here. Come on up, a little bit higher. Did you hear that voice of Revelation 4? Come up higher. And, uh, so let's agree together. Let's agree. You, you can stand if you want to. We're going to pray for Eric. Um, for healing, total healing, total healing. All right, give me your hands. Here we go. Father in heaven, we just want to agree with Belinda and John for Eric's total healing, also his wife, the whole family. Father, we just want to thank you. You continue to work this. And Father, his lungs continue to open up, open up, open up. And this nasty, this wicked thing goes in Jesus' name. And we speak clarity to those lungs, openness to those lungs. We thank You for His strength. We thank You for His well-being. Dear Lord, we thank You for Your touch upon Him in raising Him up and restoring Him whole. And we believe this and we thank You for it. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 We believe it. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, praise the Lord. Here, hon. You stay up here.
Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for your spirit upon him. We thank you for the work of grace, the true work of the spirit in their lives. We thank you, Lord, that uh, as they continue to arrive, you will actually open the door even wider. That, Lord Jesus, the voice will become clearer to come up higher. And that, Father, in Jesus' name, their love for each other will just only deepen. Their commitment to each other and to you will only deepen. That, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, all that the goodness of Isaiah 58, of Isaiah 6, of uh, Luke 15 will come to pass, and they will see it in their lives. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let Isaiah 6 resonate with their hearts, their minds, their souls, their spirits, their bodies, their pocketbooks, Father, all their relationships, and Father, also all those they deeply love. Let it flow, let it go. And Father, we just want to thank you for this. The Lord, the Lord is, is saying, "I'm taking you out of out of the shoebox." What you saw this morning in the smiles of my children is going to be the delight of your own heart in measure. For I am going to give you the Spirit without measure to every degree that you move without mixture, without the mixture of flesh or self or of the enemy, and you shall experience. Thank you for watching. Jeff Barnett is pastor at Genesis Church of Seymour. For more information about Genesis Church go to the website, https colon slash slash seymourgenesis.com. Service times are each Sunday at 10 a.m. Genesis Church is located between US 31 and I-65 on the north side of US 50 in the shops at Seymour. Visit the Genesis Church of Seymour page on Facebook. View the messages from the Genesis Church of Seymour channel on YouTube. The physical address is Genesis Church, 357 Tanger Boulevard, Suite 206, Seymour, Indiana 47274. Thank you again for watching, and may God's word continue to grow in your life.